Great. All right. Welcome to the January meeting of the user interface interest group for Evergreen. It has been a while. We haven't met since just after American Thanksgiving um, in November. I hope you all had a lovely December and restful holidays. I was mostly running around like a headless chicken as usual. Lots of travel, lots of stressful stuff going on. So um, I think... We have a couple of new people here. Do we want to go around and do introductions since it's been a while? I will kick it off. I'm Stephanie Leary. I'm the front end developer at Equinox. Um, and this is um, a group that I started uh, middle of last year to talk about user interface uh, things, which is a very broad topic. And we end up talking about lots of different stuff. But we're working on an editorial style guide to kind of unify some of the things that are a little messy and uneven in the Evergreen interface. So let me pass off for introductions to Elizabeth because she's next on my screen. I'm Elizabeth Thompson. I'm the member services manager at Noble. Oh, and uh, Ben. Hello. Um, I'm Ben Kalish. I am a cataloger at Forbes Library in Northampton. Um, and below me is Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen Mayo. I am the uh, Evergreen developer at Pines in Georgia. And I guess below me is uh, Sierra. Oh, well, all right. So uh, I'm Sierra. I am a web support specialist for CW Mars. Uh, and below me is Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pringle. I'm support and training for the BC Libraries Cooperative, uh, and we have the Sitka Consortium. And uh, next on the list is Lori. Lori doesn't have a microphone um, at uh, North Kansas City Public Library with Missouri Evergreen. Hi, Lori. Welcome. Uh, do you want to say in chat who's next on your screen? I think who has not introduced themselves yet. I have lost track. I'm a Paul Schroeder. I'm with uh, Scenic Regional Library, which is also with Evergreen, Missouri Evergreen. We're awesome. on the St. Louis side of the state of Missouri. Welcome. All Thank right. Uh, is that everyone? I think that's everyone. I think we've got Susan as well. Oh, where's Susan? There's Susan. Sorry, I'm Hi, having Susan. some technical issues. I don't know if <laughs> everyone okay. can hear me, but um, I'm Susan. I'm the uh, Pines Operations Analyst with GPLS in Georgia. Thank you. All right. I think that's everyone. Cool. Well, welcome. Um, we have at the top of our agenda document some uh, links to some of our standing projects. Um, we have um, imported some stuff into monday.com, but we haven't really started using it much yet. Um, I am hoping to get some more into that. I keep saying every month, I hope to have something set up by next month. Well, I do have something in there now, um, and it's the patron status um, badge color and icons. Um, I went ahead and did what is reflected there um, in the branch that I'm working on. Uh, and I won't be revisiting that for another month or so. So if you have thoughts on patron status colors and whether or not the message should show an icon and what the icon should be. Right now, the only icon that we have uh, showing anywhere for any status is the little um, triangle with the exclamation point in it. Um, and we show that for a couple of statuses that are uh, 
kind of important for you to know when you look at the patron, like this patron has been banned, um, things like that. Uh, we can do other icons, although they're very small in these badges. So kind of keep that in mind. The ones that have uh, a solid shape work a lot better. The The triangle is like, okay, you can, you can barely see the exclamation point, um, even at the fairly large font size that I use pretty regularly. Uh, but the triangle shape kind of gets the point across. So think about um, whether you agree with the other colors that are in there. There are several that are using the same color um, and we don't have too much um, of a range of additional colors that we can put in if we're sticking with the bootstrap palette. Um, but we do have a few more. So I added orange and purple for these, which wasn't in our original badge lineup. We could go with something like turquoise and things like that. They get kind of hard to distinguish. Um, Bootstrap doesn't have a lot of difference between things like it's blue and it's indigo. They're they're just really similar. So I kind of tried to stick with the ones that can be distinguished pretty well. But let me know what you think about all of that. Um, and that's... I, Stephanie, I just gonna say it's a, a long way back, but I think in the Zool client, there was purple and I think it mm -hmm. was for lost. Yep. Purple's in there for lost. Uh, I think there's three different types of lost things that have purple. Um, and then there's a couple of oranges for things that are sort of more than a yellow warning and not quite to the level of red. <laughs> and there's like two or three things that use red. Um, and then we have we have the additional distinction, like some of the red things are bold and have the icon and some are just red and, and like normal weight. So there's, we can do things with weight and icon or no icon uh, in addition to color. So see what you think of that. Um, the color is just one way of indicating what's, what's being conveyed there. We also have the words, which is an important accessibility point. Um, so, um, you can make comments directly on the item in Monday, or you can add comments here, um, or you can start an email thread. Um, I think there was a message to the general list, or no, it was the UI list um, a couple of months ago about this when I was getting started on it. So you can continue that thread. Um, I don't want to spend our whole meeting talking about this, but it is kind of a big change in the way that patron statuses are displayed. Um, and I know that there's a longstanding launchpad bug related to this um, because the current way that the status is indicated is just a colorful border around the name and it doesn't show the words um, unless that status gets repeated later on in the patron summary. So. This is different, this is new, um, and I do want a lot of feedback on it. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, I will be doing something similar for the ACK line item statuses coming soon. Um, that's been coming soon again for a few months. We keep kicking that can down the road as other things come up that are slightly more important than colors, but, <laughs> but colors are important. I, I apologize for coming in oh, late. Is. I'm sure you probably have already talked about this. Um, but as I'm looking in Monday and, and it has the, uh, the the column for status and of course the code, um, am I understanding correctly that there'd be the patron name and of course where these things are exactly, the patron name and then the status somehow around there um, explicitly stated like we would say barred but not the code, but the actual mm -hmm. status, and then have some color indication as well, and maybe an icon as well. Yeah, let okay. me let me go to. Um, I gotta figure out where. I have a screenshot of this, but I'm trying to figure out where it is. Um, that I can show y'all. Uh, One moment. Um, so yeah, it. Uh, and that, that's fine if you don't find the screenshot. I, 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 
I okay. like the idea of the the actual status being explicitly stated somewhere near the name mm -hmm. um, and not so far over to like the right that it gets lost in I don't I know they're not necessarily frames but in the frame yeah yeah um it is <sighs> I've lost it okay I will I will dig it out and send it to the UI mailing list so if You'll you're not on that as we're off this. <laughs> I will I will yeah. it'll be like you know 201 my time and I'll find it um but I'll send it to the UI mailing list so you can see um what I have in mind here uh but yeah and it's, um well, one of the other things that I'm proposing, uh, because we have all of those tabs across the patron summary, and then there's the other tab that has like 15 more things in its little drop down. That's really bad UI and really bad for accessibility. So what I'm thinking about is taking all of those options, doing away with other, and just making one list down the left side for all of the navigation, and then putting the patron summary, like making that the horizontal part, that goes across the top. So it little, it'll look more like the bib summary, the bib summary. Mm -hmm. but it'll have the patrons addresses and, and all of that across the top. And then you'll have all those navigation options on the left. Is the so idea it, that also would have some collapsibility to it so that you could have a mm -hmm. brief and then expanded type summary? Yes, the addresses would be collapsible. And then also the whole left thing could collapse too, if you need to get the, the data table to, to be wider. Okay, that's cool. That's yeah. Cool. So in that mode, the patron's name would appear across the top of the horizontal thing at the top of the screen, and then these badges would be underneath it, um, all colorful and, and pretty. It looks good. I've got a screenshot, and I will send that to the list as soon as we finish up here. It's still in progress, though. So like I said, feedback, very, very welcome. Um, we will talk about reports display fields. I have a feeling next month because let me skip down a little bit. I'm going to skip past our editorial style guide and all of those user work workstage preferences. All of those things are still in the works, but let me skip down to our community updates section and, um, wait a minute. What am I thinking? Yes, this, um, I want to preface this by saying this is completely informal and is just me kicking around, uh, you know, looking at the upcoming calendar of things that Equinox has worked on and things that need to be lined up if we want to achieve certain things um, with our next release and then with whatever becomes 4.0. Um, and so this is a, a list of, of things that are coming soon. <laughs> um, and so reports, um, and the report security project are almost ready to go out for community branches. They're projects that we finished internally. Um, they're, they they're done with testing. And so that will be coming up soon. And that's a major UI shift for everybody who uses reports. Um, and so we'll, I'm sure that the reports interest group will be talking about it, um, but we will probably also take a look at it too. And I think that would be a good time for us to review the, um, reports display fields. Let me go back up to this spreadsheet. Um, so this is the one I'm going to be importing into Monday. Um, and this is. Um, the name and the data type are the things that shouldn't change because those are like the, the internal codes that are used to kind of connect everything up in the IDL, but the label is fair game. Uh, and so there are ways to edit this locally in your installation, but this is what's in the, the standard IDL file. Um, and these are the simple reporter fields, um, which have a lot of... Um, Basically, everything that you could transform in the Power Reporter is like already transformed for you in Simple Reports. Um, and so there's a lot of options here. And I think when we get the new reports branch, one of the questions is going to be, do we still want that? Um, or would it be simpler to 
reduce this list um, and allow people to apply the transform that they want to get it displaying however they want. Um, um, I but, have two questions about this. Uh -huh. So this is referring to the simple reporter uh, columns labels. Mm -hmm. uh, and are these being applied back to the power reporter that's being rebuilt? I cannot remember if I, I don't think so. Power I think reporter. I call it power reporter just because that's you know, fine. Like, I just call it that or the or reporter. Compl complicated reporter, which, you know, no. The best um, reporter in the world. Right. No, uh, there are all of these things that are currently unique to the simple reporter are still in simple reporter. They're still unique then to it. Okay. The the stuff that's in reports reports is is just reporter. angularized. Yeah. Okay. So there there are two different questions there. It's like okay, sh how do these show up in in power reports, and then how do they show up in simple reports? Mm -hmm. I don't remember my second question now because I'm started going down Sorry. a rabbit trail. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. I have a question. I'll, uh -huh. I'll take a second question. Um, just based on what I can see already, it seems like there's at least one kind of bigger community question as far as terminology, um, and that is checkout. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm assuming to update the labels, we maybe want a definitive answer about is check out one or two words. Yep. And check in. And check in. Yep. You are correct. That is definitely one question that we need to resolve. Let's see if there's anything else that stands out like that uh, as we go down this list. Um, one thing I don't know if we, um, I need... I need to kind of think about the names here and make sure that we have all the pieces that we need for international naming styles. Mm -hmm. um, I think we do. I have a question about accessibility as uh -huh. well. My assumption is that these should, these labels at least should be um, readable by a screen reader. Is that the idea? Mm -hmm. um, do, can, does it read this OPAC um forward slash staff does there need to be a space between opac the forward slash and the staff um in the same way uh the oh the one that has the permission name in it with the underscore oh the view user mm -hmm. um those are those... really great questions okay yeah, I, I didn't, didn't hold the hard to stupid, but I... no, no, those are really good questions. And um, the answer is complicated. It depends on the screen reader, which and the screen reader is just creating a script that gets passed to the operating system's voice synthesizer. Mm -hmm. And that's what decides how things get pronounced. So um, and we have no control over that. <laughs> Correct. Okay. To a certain okay. extent, we we can format things differently. Um, I would like to see spaces around the slashes simply because those get used as grid column headers, mm -hmm. and when there's no space, that that chunk becomes unbreakable. Right. Um, and we don't have a a way in CSS right now to say, hey, you can break on the slash. It's too dumb for that. So it doesn't like know all the typography rules that humans know. And it just goes, ah, oh, that's an unbroken string. I will treat it as an atomic unit. So if we put a space in ourselves, then our column headers will break better. Um, and, and this is a question that's related to this um, and is gonna completely highlight how little I know about this at all. Is there a way to, with, these are not images, obviously this is text. Mm -hmm. um, but is there a way to have alternative text for text? Yeah. Um, and especially for things like table headers, there are ARIA labels and things like that. 
Okay. Because um, I'm thinking like TCN, if it was, was to try to pronounce that as a word, as yeah. opposed to reading the initials, does it do screen readers, are they intelligent enough to know that if it's all capitalized, maybe it is an abbreviation, um, but then you have something else that's all capitalized and it's not. So, I mean, thinking from an AI standpoint, how how would it differentiate without being taught that? And it sounds like an ARIA label could do that. But yeah. The other, sorry, I was just going to say the, the other potential is maybe that label shouldn't be OPAC staff client username. Like mm -hmm. maybe we're at the point where it should be, I don't know, just username or just account username. username. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because, you know, if it's the OPAC and the staff client username, it is, it's an account Both username. Places. Yeah, yeah. It's the username. And the same with the hold alias. Maybe, maybe it's time to just completely rethink those ones entirely. Yeah, mm -hmm. is alias used in any other context other than that? Well, because we, the yeah, I don't think the hold alias is like I don't think there is a hold alias in any other spot other than the um, the one that's used as an alias for the username. Right. Yeah, all of these are great questions. Okay. Uh, and the, I will pull out a link that I have um, in my files about how screen readers handle um, abbreviations and things that are all in uppercase. Uh, one complication, like normally you can use the ABBR tag, um, but there's the screen reader support for that is not as great as you would hope, given that it's a fairly important accessibility feature. Um, and honestly, the voice synthesizer is just gonna do whatever it's gonna do. And at a certain point we throw up our hands and we say, okay, you know, people are um, going to get used to how their voice synthesizer handles common abbreviations and they're going to deal with it. Um, when we try to micromanage it, we, we get into trouble. So, um, and there are places where it won't really honor the abbreviation tag, even if we put it in, into the HTML. I think table headers is one of them. I have a I have a whole article specifically about that. I remember reading about a month ago. Um, and so it, this is one of those cases where I want to pay attention to the abbreviation, I mean, to the punctuation and um get that right and actually i'm and you know um ben and i are just talking in the chat about um the uh how to handle the word breaking um and i've actually got it working much better in the table based uh grid thing that is also again still coming soon um so it isn't, it's dealing with those slashes a lot more gracefully. Um, but yeah, uh, good questions about whether we should write things out or put them as abbreviations, um, whether we should put a, an ARIA label on it that has the, f the, the fully written out version. Those are all great questions that I think we need to discuss <laughs> one by one as we go down this very long list. <laughs> so and I will get this. Go ahead. So I was just saying for some of them, I'm, I don't know if we want to think about a wider reach for some of the questions, just because if we're going to change the label, like if we decide that we think the label for OPAC staff client username should change, that also changes the label on the patron registration form and other places. So I feel like it's it becomes a bigger discussion because it's going to affect everybody who does circulation because we're changing what something's called. For sure. I still think we should change it. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we're going to want to publicize that conversation outside just the UI interest group and bring in both reports and the general mailing list to catch all the folks who work in circulation since we don't really have a dedicated circulation users group right now. Um, yeah, I agree. So I will get all of this imported into Monday um, in time for our next meeting. Promise, pinky swear. <laughs> um, but yeah, 
Okay. Uh, any more questions about things that were on? Oh, while we're, I'm, I'm bouncing around a little bit. Sorry, it's ADHD show and tell hour here. Um, down in the roadmap, I have a bunch of related items that need these these are all like the dominoes that need to fall into place for us to achieve a uh, dark mode or any kind of user selected color mode but also um and i just put in a launchpad ticket for this i think about a week ago uh the windows high contrast mode and forced colors mode which are operating system level dark modes or like an enforced color scheme, um, which is different than like a website that gives you a little light dark toggle. Um, they're similar. And if we do the OS level version, we get a lot of what we need for the UI controlled version. But uh, one of the big pieces that needs to fall into place for us to really be able to achieve this is to go through all of our CSS files and all of our inline styles and get those color definitions that are all defined as hex values out into variables. Um, and that way we can replace it. So we can say, hey, if it's dark mode, use the dark mode variables. And if it's light mode, use the light mode. Um, I have a branch started for that, that really I think only covers the main CSS file. Um, and I've added myself a little task on here to put that out as a collab branch so that everybody else can um, kind of pitch in on this. Um, it's going to be a tedious project to, to just search through all the CSS files and um, find all of the colors, basically. But um, if anybody is um, new to development and wants an easy thing to start with, that would be an awesome one. And I will tag it uh, as a bite-sized project. <laughs> Steven, you're on my list to hit for this, but I wanted to invite some of our other new folks too and see uh, if any of them want to help. And I think this is something where we have enough modules and you know bits and pieces that have lots of colors buried deep in the component, like, like eight components down in some places like AC, um, where we can divide and conquer on this. And so I'll get these into um, a Monday board as well uh not like all the color definitions but like the modules and the the components and we so can hard coded of... colors are going to be the next dojo <laughs> yeah they oh, are it's still there it's still there um no i know it's so close though we're so close we're so close i know i know you know how close we are um so uh that will be something where we can kind of assign ourselves to look through a certain set of files and just post everything to a single collab branch and, and get all these cleaned up. Any questions about that? Okay, I skipped over some stuff um, in the uh, agenda. So let me go back up to the rest of our community updates. Um, I hope everyone got to attend one of the two community meetings that happened over the past couple of weeks. Um, Ruth, is there going to be a summary of the conversation from those? Um, Maybe. Yes, <laughs> but I'm not entirely sure how that's going to come out. So um, okay. the main purpose of that there will definitely be stuff that comes out of it. The main purpose of those meetings was of course to communicate, um, but then also to gather information that is going to be going to our facilitator uh, who is going to be um, facilitating uh, for the stakeholder uh, retreat, strategic mm -hmm. planning retreat that's happening the 22nd through the 24th which will get invitations sent out uh, pretty soon for that. Um, uh, so that input okay. is going to the, from the survey and from those who attended is going to be used to inform the strategic plan. 
So gotcha. if you did not get the opportunity to attend one of those community uh, conversations um, or you were not at the uh, developer conversation at the Hackaway, or you just have an idea and you want to put it in there and you are at every single one of those and you have more to say, fill out that survey uh, and uh, that will go um, into that pool of information. I will let you know we did just approve, we being the, the Evergreen Project Board, uh, to accept a statement of work from Carson Block. So if you're familiar with Car Carson Block Consulting, he and his team are going to be uh, functioning uh, as facilitator for the, 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 the project, the, the strategic planning plan. So Google them if you're not familiar. I think that you'll be pretty impressed. Um, or you can email me if you'd also like to see the statement of work that he uh, provided. It gives a long list of uh, their um, other things that they have they've worked on in the past. So we're pretty excited to have them facilitating for us. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I feel like I just like completely soapboxed a whole lot there accidentally. I invited you to because I wanted to to hear what uh, was up with the the aftermath of the community meetings. So that's perfect. Thank cool. you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that we uh, we being the release team that I sort of attached myself to for three twelve, <laughs> not originally being on it. Uh, we had been doing um, weekly code reviews on Mondays and uh, we decided to keep those going after the release cycle was done. So we took a little break for the holidays, but we're back. Um, and uh, Jane and Taryn and I are sort of jointly hosting these. Um, we are hoping at some point to sort of make a formal UI office hours thing out of it, but I can't commit to that just yet. So right now uh, what we're doing is kind of going through the uh, pull requests that we want in the next few releases. And we're just going through them and collaboratively reviewing those pull requests, signing off when we can, sending them back for you know needs work um, if that's what's needed. Um, and we're doing, uh, you know, we often get through two to four pull requests in a meeting um, and it's a really great learning opportunity. So Super I'm fun. learning a lot. Yeah, it's fun. We get to kind of go, what does this code do? And um, it's great. So those are on the community calendar and we would be delighted uh, to have you join us for those. Uh, the other thing community-wise that I worked on in the past month or so was turning the issues that were found in our VPAT uh, accessibility conformance report um, that so the, the board had commissioned an external accessibility review of the OPAC last fall, and we got the formal report. Uh, and it's a, kind of a spreadsheet that has some very terse comments on how we do or, or don't conform to various accessibility requirements. So I took the, the things where we don't uh, meet the standard and turned those into launchpad bugs. So if you follow the bug tracker, you saw a flurry of new accessibility bugs from me a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was all for these. Uh, these again are a good opportunity for somebody to jump in as a new developer, I think. Um, we have an accessibility guide in the wiki where I have linked to the relevant pages uh, on the bug wherever I could. I've done my best to explain exactly what the issue is that um, is being called out in the very terse comment on the spreadsheet and like make words happen uh, to explain what's ha what's going on there and what the, the problem is and how to fix it. If you are interested in tackling any of those bugs and you don't fully understand what the problem is or what the recommended solution is, please email me. I will be happy to expound on that further. Um, I have kind related. of a limited. Uh huh. So I was just say related to that, Stephanie. Did you get a copy of the spreadsheet that we got from the testing we had done in November? No. Um, so we have the National Network for Equitable Library Service as part of the co-op, um, yeah. and they actually went through and tested the three eleven OPAC um, for us in November. 
And so we have a spreadsheet with uh, 108 issues they Ooh. found. Um, yeah. It's on our list to start kind of going through and trying to figure out which ones haven't made it to Launchpad yet. Um, we're kind of waiting on having a 312 test server for us to use as well, though, because we don't want to report things that have been fixed in 312. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, we, we're we not quite sure like how it lines up with what was already reported as part of the VPAT. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's on our, our list and I can, I'll double check with Sharon, but I'm pretty sure I can send you a copy of the spreadsheet if you, if you're interested. <laughs> awesome. And I, would be happy to sit down with you at some point and just go through the spreadsheet and translate to Launchpad. And I have a spreadsheet too um, that I pulled out of all the accessibility bugs uh, with that tag in Launchpad. And I kind of keep that as a to-do list internally and I've got it all color coded and stuff. So I've got the OPAC bugs uh, tagged in that spreadsheet and I've memorized it at this point because that's what I've been working from like for the past year. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, can... I would love to take you up on that. I can eyeball it and say, oh, that's in Launchpad or that's in, that's not, um, yeah. I'd, yeah, I'd be happy to go through that with you. And I'm sure that that contains things that didn't quite like make it to the surface of the, the ACR because that is looking at very specific things. Um, and so like a, a general accessibility review is going to call out a lot more. Um, and yeah. Yeah. it also might have like, 15 different instances of the same fundamental bug as we have seen in the staff client sometimes. Um, I think it definitely does. Yeah. Uh, so that would be great. Yeah. Um, let's get together and, and figure out when we can go through that. And if anybody else is interested in kind of just going through that with us and as a, like a learning exercise, um, or if you are, I'm assuming that I am the only one who is that familiar with the accessibility tag in Launchpad. I, that may not be the case. Maybe one of you has made a detailed study of these bugs. Um, but I'm working on the assumption that I'm the only one nerdy enough to have done that. So <laughs> that may be a poor assumption. But if you would like to join us for that, leave a note in the chat or email both of us and we will figure out when we can do that. Um, that's great. I'm excited that we have both of those to work from. Uh, and I would love to get some of these fixed uh, for our next mm -hmm. release if we can. Jennifer, I will say the only OPAC bug that I know of that got fixed in 3.12 uh, had to do with the auto suggest function on the search. And that was Jane's big rewrite of that feature. I saw that it looked like there were some like minor mm -hmm. display fixes that I thought might lead in or be also be accessibility in 3.11.2 because we're mm. currently running 3.11.1. Okay. Yeah. There may be a few button changes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we're currently looking at, like, it, this has jumped up on our priority list right now because um, Manitoba has legislation coming in May 1st yes. um, that will affect our Manitoba libraries. Excellent. All right. Well, let's see what we can do to get all those fixed. I know one of the fundamental things about the OPAC is that it is laid out using tables, which is a kind of a old school way of doing web design. Um, and anybody who wants to tackle changing that to a more modern CSS layout, be my guest. <laughs> I would love to, but I have my time is committed elsewhere. So um, I created a, a wiki page recently in the new devs area for CSS grid layout because I'm starting to introduce that in some of the staff client areas. So if you um, aren't familiar with uh, the native CSS grid features, like not not Bootstrap's 12 column grid, but the, the actual like display colon grid display property in CSS, um, I added some references there. It's not totally new, but it's in the last five years or so that it's um, become a, uh, widely available in browsers. Um, and the, the good thing is it was under a test flag for like seven years before that. So it's really solid, even though um, it's kind of like a relatively new way of laying things out. Um, it's not as buggy as Flexbox was when that came out. 
So um, grid layouts are fantastic. And I am so excited that we can do things like named template areas. Uh, and they're, it's just so much fun. Um, I'm using them extensively in reports. So you'll see that uh, when we get that community branch out. Um, it's exciting. OK. Uh, the other community thing I wanted to mention is that a few bugs have come up that are in 3.11 specifically that were fixed in 3.12 but didn't get backported far enough uh, just because the, the patch didn't apply cleanly or whatever. So a few things have popped up as people are upgrading to 3.11. Um, and I wanted to call these out so that if you are in charge of your installation, you know, you can apply the patches for these, or, um, you can, you know, add some heat to it so that we can get a working branch for 3.11 out, uh, in time for the point release and get these cleaned up. Um, all of these are fixed in 3.12. It's just a matter of backporting them. Uh, the... The one that is, like that third one is is just kind of cosmetic, but these first two are are kind of functional problems with buttons. And if you will remember when we when we met last, I said, hey, we did this giant button cleanup, and there's going to be some glitches with submit functionality and buttons. And sure enough, we hit one of them right out of the gate with ACK. So. And it was the reverse of what I thought. Uh, I thought, you know, we would get one where the form submitted when you didn't expect it to. No, we got one where the form didn't submit uh, when you expected it to. So they're both aspects of the same problem. Oh, evergreen. Uh, uh, well, that was me. <laughs> no, that was me. I know, but it does feel like an evergreen thing. It, it what? Does. You were it's, expecting it's what? Evergreen. What bug? <laughs> <laughs> You're expecting keyboard functionality to work in evergreen. How silly of you. No. Uh, it should work. And I bobbled that in changing like 400 bug or 400 buttons all at once. There were like, you know, a handful that got the wrong type. <sighs> so it goes. Um, so I just wanted to call those out for your attention. And then uh, the last section that we have on here, and I know we're running out of time because we just have so much to talk about this month. Um, but there are some new UI related bugs that could really use your feedback. Um, and this first one on the list, uh, Kathy happened to post something to the listserv this week that matched very closely a project that we had just finished. And so Mike went and tidied up that branch and, and got it out for community review. Uh, it's kind of two approaches to the, the problem. Um, and there's some discussion on Kathy's plan on like how we could do this, whether we want to flag, whether we want to do it with custom OU trees. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, I don't know that anyone has this up on a test server. <sighs> I know that we don't. Let me see what we can do about that. Um, but you can see some screenshots um, in the launchpad bug and kind of think through what you think uh, of all of that. Stephanie, I'm skipping these other ones to go down to that fourth one real quick uh -huh. because that seems to me to be one of the issues that was highlighted that needed to be addressed when it comes to um, an accessibility issue. Yep. Um, using not to stop, I mean, to stop using focus, field focus. Is it, was I understanding that correctly? Ah, two different things. So when things do have focus, we want them to be highlighted so that you can see where and you that's are. that's what this is, yes. And that's what this is. Now, the question of whether we auto-focus on a particular form field when a page loads is a related but different issue. Right. Um, yes. And when we do, we want it highlighted so that you know what has focus. Um, is there an indication based on this focus rather than just the color? Um, for no. the accessibility standpoint, the saying we just skipped a bunch of stuff or autofocus is in play. <laughs> There's nothing like that, and that's the issue. So okay. when we 
load up a page that has, you know, a search bar and we want to focus on that first, that's okay, but it needs to be the first Thing. field in that form. Right. Rather than the drop downs for like search type or whatever. Right. So the catalog search is where we hit this frequently. I think there's might there might be some spots in ACK as well um, that we need to think about, but for sure the catalog search where we have drop down, drop down, drop down, and then the field where we autofocus, the screen reader skips straight to that focused field and they don't know that there's stuff behind them. Um, so we need to rearrange that form um, or give the the user a, an option to not autofocus things. And then this also is, I think, related to this do, talking about the Z3950 mm -hmm. and uh, the federated mark search, the same thing. Um, but when those focuses, the default focus is changed, um, this would still, this would impact that as well is the idea or is, because mm. I, I think that those are different. It's a different type of focus, right? Yeah. It is. Should they be wrapped into this? Because well, while it's different type from a user standpoint, I mean, they don't, they don't care what kind of box that is. They don't care. I mean, we care, but they don't. They're like. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in Z39, when you choose a default, you don't automatically get focused on that field, if I'm remembering correctly. You do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you if you take a radio box, that becomes your focus field. Oh, I don't even remember seeing that as we built that interface. That's fun. Okay. It's interesting. It's uh, a weird little thing. Yeah. Neat. Okay. <laughs> I see well, you saying the word neat, but I don't see it in your eyes. <laughs> you see the sarcasm on my face. I um, do. Yeah. So anytime we we autofocus something, we have to give the user a way to opt out or indicate somehow that there are other fields that um, they've missed. Yeah, Ben? There, there is an option that hasn't been discussed, I think, if I'm understanding this fully. Um, before saying that, I wanna say, all my instinct says, if you possibly can, make the thing you want to receive the focus, the first focusable thing, Yes, because for that's sure. That's just intuitive, mm -hmm. right? And then you don't need to deal with any of the other solutions. Mm -hmm. But the thing that hasn't been mentioned is skip links. Yeah. So if you have the first thing that people are likely to be focused has to be way down on the page, then can you put a link near? Don't make it actually autofocus. Make the focus go at the top, but then have a link very near the top that people will get to as they're tabbing that will jump to that thing. So like jump to search yeah. if for some reason search for some crazy reason has to be way down the page, you can have something that jumps you to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that way you can still have the focus default to the first focusable thing and have people able to make that jump quickly if they need to. Let me put in a link in the chat to this other bug that has a branch <laughs> that needs review. <laughs> yeah, it is exactly like that. And right now we don't have any uh, skip links in the staff interface, partly because Angular makes it difficult. Um, and so this branch uh, involves a change to the router configuration, which makes me nervous. Um, <laughs> The the one for Angular JS is fine. The one for um, Angular, uh, this is a this is a patch of a patch. So there's there's two changes here, but this is the um, this is the relevant part. So we're I just need folks who know Angular configuration better than I do to review this patch and make sure that it doesn't uh, break anything else. Because Angular doesn't really 
handle link fragments very well. So when you you go to the hash tag, you know, section of the page, it doesn't like that. Um, it intercepts that and tries to use it as part of its routing logic. And we we want it to ignore that and and skip down to the page like a browser normally would. And in order to do that, we have to basically say explicitly, hey, router, quit it. Don't do your thing. Just let the browser do its thing. Because Angular is greedy and its developers don't know squat about accessibility. And so they didn't implement one of the oldest and most fundamental accessibility accommodations, which is the skip link. So yes, we can think about where to sprinkle other skip links once we get that fundamental, you know, the one at the top that, that goes down to the main content that everyone expects to see first on the page. That's what this patch does. And with that in place, we could then add more skip links throughout. Yeah. Good point. I just wanted to come back to what Ruth was saying about the Z3950 defaults, just uh -huh. to, because I think it uh, isn't always something that people think about. The default fields for Z3950 change depending on what sources you have and what how you've set them up. So depending on what you pick as your default, if you change your sources, that might not be a field that's used anymore, or it might be a field that is in a different, like the order changes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so I don't know very what that complex. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that does as far as like autofocus and stuff, but even if you picked, you know, one of the fields to be the first one, if you change your sources, it might reorder it so that that autofocus field is no longer the first one in the form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we just worked on that form for the angularized Angular version. A, yeah. And I don't remember what we did with the focus. So I'm going to have to go look at that branch and see if we need to. It's Revise better. It. Just, just, I mean, it's the interface really is, is better. The In interface general, is yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I got to go look at the focus behavior and see um, what we're doing there. And we are almost out of time and we've spent the entire time just talking about all these updates. Uh, I, again, will get all of those things for the reports stuff into Mondays so that we can look at that next time. Um, is there anything else anyone wants to discuss in our last? Do you video? have uh, the the middle two bugs here? Are they on a test server? No. Okay. Is there a possibility to get them on a test server or maybe to shunt that to the collaborative code review possibly? Yes. Let me push those to the code review team and see if I can get those slated on for one of our so Monday meetings. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll I'll be able to about putting those up. Mm -hmm. Will Feedback Fest be February? That's a great Is question. Only when Feedback Fest happens? Let me check with Taryn. I think so. So we'll make sure that those get into Feedback Fest for sure. Um, and Stephanie, I just wanted to say I stuck the um ACK line statuses into Monday. Oh, beautiful. Um, Thank you. Based on the documentation we have, I didn't yeah. put colors in because I don't think what is in our documentation actually matches the okay. um, the angularized colors. Um, mm -hmm. But I did the, I just stuck the beginning information in there. Yep. Okay. Uh, I have a code pen somewhere that has my initial proposal for the new colors back from the last evergreen conference and I haven't gotten any further with it since then but I will pull that out and add that to the Monday um, board and um, I need some feedback from people who use selection lists versus not um, and people who are using EDI versus not because I know those colors change and the the available status list changes depending on those things so we need to make sure that each set works depending on what your configuration is yeah uh, we have libraries that use selection lists if we need to Great. do something 
Um, we discovered okay. that when selection lists broke in 311 because we didn't realize we had libraries using selection lists. Delightful. Mm. It was permission, so it was easy to fix. Oh, but, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, now I know of, I think, three libraries for sure who use them, so we can poke them um, for some of that. If... Awesome. Okay. Anybody else have anything that we need to bring up? All right, we will slowly but surely get through some of these things and start working on um, some standards that we can write down in our fledgling little style guide. Um, I think we already have something about the slashes, but we can uh, add something about uh, abbreviations in column headings and I will add that as to me. Uh, another thing that I will say too in this just because it happens to be on my mind because I had a meeting yesterday uh, of course the conference is coming up in April I think at the end of that and there's going to be a hack fest uh, on that Friday Thursday Thursday or Friday. It's on the calendar. Don't don't go by anything I say about these dates. But uh, the user interest groups are going to be on that day, but that may also be an opportunity to um, get some quality collaborative work uh, done. So something, something to think about. Great. Okay. It's the Thursday, the 25th is the Hackfest. Of April? Yeah, of April. Awesome. And the pre-conference is the Monday, the 22nd, and the conference is the 23rd, 24th. Right. Because we've broken our conference into three pieces. And there, yeah, gotcha. it's, it's for registration purposes. Yeah. So there are three different registrations. Uh, you have to register for the Hackfest, but it's free registration. Right. Thank you for that. I did not have that on our upcoming let's, event list. Let's meet in inside. person way more often than we meet. <laughs> If possible in the future, anyway. Yes. All um, right. Yeah. I think that's it. I'm going to stop the share and stop the recording. All right. Thank you, everyone.